everyone. Um, my name is Sunita Longo and I'm the event manager for tonight's program. On behalf of the MIT Club of Northern California, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. So tonight's panel, uh, with tonight's panel, we'll learn more about the exciting opportunities in smart grid innovation. But before we start the panel, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the MIT Energy and Clean Tech series. Our mission is really to educate and engage friends and alumni of MIT on the highly important topics of energy and clean technology. We feature highly distinguished academics and executives on four types of programs throughout the year. Uh, panel discussions, such as what we're having tonight, MIT professors on the road, such as the program that we had last month with Professor Bonasiti on solar TV panel, C-level executive series, such as the program that we had earlier in the year with Tony Early, PGN CEO, and tours of uh, interesting facilities of energy and clean tech facilities, such as the California ISO room that we will be touring next month. So with that, I would like to actually introduce you to our moderator tonight, Don Keller. Don is a partner and board member at Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe, and he will actually lead tonight's discussion as the moderator. Please welcome Don to the stage. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I look forward to this. This should be very interesting. Um, Oric has these types of uh, presentations through its Total Access program very frequently, and um, they worked out very well, and this should be equally interesting. Our emerging companies practice includes a big clean tech uh, component, including a couple of very um, high profile, what you call smart grid, I think, uh, companies called O-Power and Nest, um, which are doing very well, but it's, again, it's a very broad area. So with that, let me introduce uh, our panelists on the far side of the panel, uh, Steve Malai, the Vice President of Customer Energy Solutions at PG&E. Uh, next to him, Andy White. He's <laughs> <laughs> got family in the audience. <laughs> uh, the CEO of Trilliant a provider of smart grid communications solutions. And next to him, Lisa Caswell, the president of eMeter, uh, turns meter data into usable information. Uh, and next to her, Brian Thompson, the founding CEO of STEM, an energy use optimization company that uh, visualizes, predicts, and benchmarks electricity use. So with that, um, why don't we start off with, um, I think, I think uh, Steve, you'll give your presentation first. Each, let me just say, each of the panelists will give a five minute presentation or so on their company and perspective on the, on the smart grid, and then we'll, we'll have a panel discussion, and then after that, we'll have audience questions. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I uh, work at PG&E. I'm a vice president for our customer energy solutions team. And in that organization, I basically run all of the customer programs that we offer, energy efficiency, demand response, uh, distributed generation, electric vehicles, all the things that are really on the customer side of the meter. But you know, at PG&E, we are the gas and electric supplier for Northern and Southern California. We have uh, approximately 5 million customers um, across that territory. We're also uh, one of the, the greenest utilities in the country. We have uh, roughly 50% of our energy supply that's uh, non-carbon emitting. Uh, we're on our way to a 33% renewable standard in the state, and we have more distributed generation in our service territory than anyone else in the country by far. I don't remember the exact statistics. We're growing at about 1,000 customers a month, and we have uh, probably somewhere around 70,000 of our customers right now who have distributed solar. So with that though, I wanted to, that's pretty much my intro on PG&E. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of what do we care about, um, particularly in relation to this topic. And you know, when you get right down to it, our fundamental objective at PG&E is to deliver safe and reliable and affordable gas and electric to our customers. It's a pretty simple mission, um, but it's pretty complicated to do, and it's getting harder. And that's what I think I wanted to talk about today. 
Um, if I could turn to the first slide. I want to start with a little bit about the legacy in California, because I think this is important. Um, this chart is a, is a pretty well-known chart. Um, it's from the California Energy Commission. And it shows that really, um, since the mid-70s, when California made a public policy decision to focus on energy efficiency as a key resource and align all the market players to support it, uh, since that time, California energy use per capita has basically remained flat. Now think of everything that you have in your home that you plug into the wall today that you did not have in the mid-70s. But energy use in this state has remained flat on a per capita basis. The rest of the country has doubled. That is our legacy, but it's also intended to be our future. And if anything, we need to keep and curve that, that uh, bend that curve down. So the question and the challenge for us is how do we deal with an energy future without forgetting our past and really moving it forward? Now it's getting more complicated. Let's go to the next chart. When we think about what's happening on the grid today, um, we have a lot more renewable resources than we've ever had before. The traditional uh, energy resource, the one that if you are an energy planner and you're asked to provide resources and put them on the grid to generate electricity, the one you like is the one that looks nice and flat. Turn it on, stays on. Or maybe turn it on once a day, turn it off once a day. But it's a pretty flat curve. This is a wind plant. This is an actual wind plant. This graph is from the California Independent System Operator. And you know, look at that graph and recognize, for a system operator, that's a tough graph to deal with. They're used to dealing with things that look pretty straight and pretty flat. And in that nine minute period, 120 megawatts of generation disappeared as the wind slowed down. Now, the load didn't change, so 120 megawatts of generation had to appear somewhere else to make up for that graph. Now, let's go forward one more. When you think about a typical load, what does the, the California Independent System Operator see? This is, again, their graph. I'm appreciative of their graphs for us. This is a typical day. Uh, let's see, actually a few days ago, 10, 22, 12. This is actually kind of a winter day in California. Um, we see two peaks, which is our characteristic in California during the winter. You see a little bit of a peak sort of in the early morning hour. Um, kind of coming up to about 10 o'clock. Then it stays relatively flat through most of the day. Then you hit about 5 o'clock, and between 5 and 7 o'clock, you see about 2,000 megawatts of generation of load come on. This is people getting home, turning on lights, turning on air, or turning on heating, that type of thing. 2,000 megawatts, that's less than 10% of that peak load. But in that two-hour time period, generation has to come on to meet that demand. That's actually a pretty easy graph to manage and we have the systems in place and we know how to manage that graph, that is not the graph of our future. Let's go one more forward. That blue line that you see on the very top is pretty much an equivalent graph. It's the load. Now, this is a forecast of what is it gonna look like in 2020. The green line represents the wind that's gonna be on the system. The orange or the yellow line represents the solar that's gonna be on the system. Now those are two technologies that don't turn off. We don't just turn them off. The sun comes up, it generates electricity. The wind blows, it generates electricity. The red line is actually the net. So the red line is now the graph that the ISO, the CAISO, has to manage. Now let's think about what that, how that's different. Now, during the middle of the day, actually 5,000 megawatts of generation is coming off the system. We are shutting down generating plants throughout the day as the load, the net load's coming down. And look at that afternoon peak. Now in two hour time frame, we used to bring 2,000 megawatts on in two hours, now we're bringing 12,000 megawatts on in two hours. So why am I showing this? At the end of the day, every one of us living here in California wants to make sure these guys always have enough power on the system so that whenever we turn on a light, it'll always be there. We don't wanna change our expectation Lights are reliable, they always come on. But the tools we have to manage it have to change. We cannot solve tomorrow's problems with the, the solutions we used in the past. We can't always just build another big generating plant um, and somehow do it. Well, I shouldn't say that, you know, we can. We could solve this problem by building a bunch of generating plants that we can turn on and off four or five times a day. But that would really invalidate that legacy that we've built in the state of California and wouldn't help us move forward on our goals. I believe the things we're gonna talk about today are critical to solve that problem. 
And that's what we care about a lot at PG&E. That's a great presentation. Thank you very much. That was great, Steve. Why don't we move to Andy's presentation, CEO of Trillion. Thank you. <clears throat> My name's Andy White. I'm the CEO of Trillion. We're headquartered uh, just up the road here in Redwood City. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is how we support our customers, just like PG&E, working along with our partners to, to my left here. So we're a network communications company, so we provide solutions to utilities along with our partners to provide the infrastructure, let's say, and the communications technology that enable to solve the problems for the utilities along with our partners. Can I go to the first slide? So, we have a perfect setup around what are the challenges. Limited supply, whether we're talking about aging nuclear plants, fossil power plants, carbon constraints, intermittent power, solar plants only when the sun is shining, or wind only when the wind is blowing, a tremendous amount of challenges to the utility industry enabling to provide reliable power to people like the consumers. So one of the things that we are doing to help solve those challenges is we provide a two-way communication technology between the energy supply and the demand. We have better visibility for the utilities and for the consumers to be able to monitor and control the energy usage. And we can actually enhance energy efficiency with better operational flexibility and the integration of renewables or whether you have electric vehicles, or you have distributed generation, etc. Go to the next slide. So are we, as Trilliant, so we're headquartered here in Silicon Valley with the operations in U.S., Canada, Europe, South America, and Asia. So the smart grid thing is not just about the U.S. and North America. It's really proliferating throughout the globe. In fact, we're probably going to be in 60% of our business outside the United States today. We're a high technology company. We have over 15 industrial patents. You can see here some of our partners. You can see some of our expertise. You can see our investors. Um, several investors, we have a very nice mix of what we call strategic large company investors in both Europe and uh, in the United States uh, and, uh, and in Asia. And we really have a truly global platform. So while we're headquartered here in Silicon Valley using our great engineers and technology, we have a platform that services the entire world uh, for the smart grid. Can we go to the next slide? So n not only able to service the customers and all the stakeholders, there's actually a benefit for all the stakeholders here. And this is a McKinsey study and EPRI have done other work here in Palo Alto, but this is about the savings and the benefits at three different levels. We talk about the grid level, so we're talking about transmission, distribution all the way through the substations. We talk about metering, so advanced metering infrastructure, so that's meters on the side of everybody's home, whether that's gas and electric, or that's metering on industrial plants or office complexes, and also stakeholder benefits in the, in, in the consumer. So the business equation for this is we want to try and improve the life of the utility, so it makes better operational efficiency improving the grid operations, outage detection, outage restoration, the better use of electrons through into the home, and allow the consumer or the industrial complex to make better decisions to improve their electricity and gas bill. And then also, the other side benefit is to try and improve through smart use of your devices within the home to enable us to level load for the utility. How do we encourage people to use their dishwashers or their washing machines or pumps and things that they don't really need to have uh, operating and running during the day in the critical peak times. You saw that peak curve that we just showed for PG&E, which is very similar to the rest of the United States. How do we shift that so we can have more level load and less expensive, less carbon footprint generation in the middle of the day? Next slide, please. So where are we operating today? And we operate with our partners here, but uh, a large footprint in, in the United States and Canada. 
with uh, with projects that uh, are doing everything from time of use building in the terrace to new projects that we're just doing inside the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom are moving very, very quickly in an open market, very different from what we've got here in the US. And we've just started operations in both South America and Brazil, Ecuador, and in Asia where we've just started up operations in Singapore, covering new winds in Malaysia, Thailand, and moving into the Philippines. So we're really excited about this global opportunity run out of a company here in Silicon Valley. So that's all I had right now. Let me turn this over. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, Lisa Caswell, the president of eMeter. Fantastic. And thank you, everybody. And thanks for uh, my co-panelists here. So the first uh, thing I want to set straight about eMeter is we are not a metering company. We don't make <laughs> hardware at all, despite the name. Um, it has an <coughs> immense amount of brand recognition, but we are 100% a software company, also based here in uh, Silicon Valley in Foster City. As you can see from the name, uh, we're a Siemens business. We were purchased by Siemens in January of this year, which has a tremendous amount of uh, opportunities and interest across uh, the entire grid platform, given the access and the number of solutions we have in internally. So eMeter actually got its start, and I was just uh, telling Steve earlier that uh, we started um, by building one of the first MDM meter data management solutions specifically for PG&E uh, almost 12 years ago now. Um, and it was one that was hosted and managed by us. It was essentially a cloud service at the time, well before the concept of cloud was happening. Um, only to have PG&E begin to tell us, hey, we'd really like to have something behind our firewall. Um, for which we then went and built that solution. And hence is our energy IP, energy information platform. And so uh, eMeter is not just a meter data management company. It is what we call a completely an energy information platform. And one of the things that excites us and excites us, especially being a part of Siemens, is that when you think about it, um, this is a purpose-built solution designed specifically for utilities and the utilities marketplace, but the utilities marketplace is the last great uh, industrial revolution that's going to come through that's really going to change as a result of technology having a play in it. And you know, the finance companies went through it 30 years ago, the telcos went through it, you know, with the whole concept of ATMs and later online banking and then telcos went through it and you know we've seen cell phones and now things like Skype and now healthcare is going through it you know with full paperless hospitals in some cases so now it's utilities turn and so it really is what it's all up to our imagination it's going to be a fundamental change as Steve said in complete business models it's not software we've even thought about um, and where e-meters play is is how we actually manage the information. Because it's all about that information capture, ensuring that it's good, clean, what I call healthy information. And then from there, we can decide what to do with it. And it may be setting up new trading schemes. It may be doing analytics specific. It may be doing demand response right now. But we don't know. But the power of it is having it in a platform from which you can do anything. Can we go to the next slide? Oh gosh, these are going to do builds. You may just click right right through, go on to the next next one. So really it's all about turning this information into new things. And so we are ultimately the source of truth for the utilities marketplace and to serve co-partners. So SIM's not yet a partner of ours, but we may so soon solve for that. Um, Tr Trillium most certainly is. Um, and the whole concept is around the ecosystem of being able to take good information in. So if anything that can be metered, we can measure it, monitor it, and put it out to any different type of uh, information system that the utilities own, whether it's their GIS, workforce management systems, billing systems, outage management systems, and so that's what it's all about. But that's just the beginning. Go to the next slide, please. Purpose-built IT for the utilities, because utilities don't take any offense to this, tend to be a little risk adverse, and we need them to be risk adverse because we need the lights to go on. And you know, so there's a there's there's a reason for it, and it's something that we have to be able to respect. But we've got to do it in such a way to provide them the flexibility and the ability to innovate. And so the way that we do that is to have a platform and then have applications. So through eMeter, Siemens will have the first smart grid app store. We're already building applications. Our partners are building applications. The utilities themselves will be building applications, and that's really the the place for eMeter and 
solutions we're going to bring to market. So uh, I would argue your imagination is our opportunity. Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Brian Thompson, the founding CEO of uh, STEM. Hi, everyone. This is working. So we are a energy optimization company. We are on the customer side of the meter. We're about four years old, Silicon Valley venture funded company based up in Milbrae, California. And we kind of represent the customer, I guess, portion of this equation. We're not utility centric on any level. Uh, we are actually developing a custom built application for commercial customers to help them save money on their utility bills by optimizing their energy use. And we do this We'll go ahead and click on the next slide here. <coughs> We've done this by building a service platform that's built on kind of three major building blocks. The first one is what we call high definition data. Uh, this is uh, not 15 minute data, but faster. I think faster than one minute, faster than 30 seconds. But we use one second level data, combine it with rich metadata, such as your weather and sunrise and sunset and all sorts of other things that go on throughout the day. And with this type of data, we feed a rich suite of algorithms, predictive analytics, decision algorithms, econometric modeling that allows us to make smarter decisions about how to use an intelligent energy storage platform to effectively remap the energy curve for commercial businesses. And in so doing, we allow them to save a significant amount on their energy bills without asking them to change anything about their operations or their behavior throughout the day. So most people are familiar with energy efficiency which is effectively using less energy, uh, we are looking at the next stage, which is using the energy that you have to use, lights are on, cameras rolling, uh, to allow you, allow you to use it more optima optimally than you would otherwise. The opportunity, uh, and I'm going to thank Steve for setting this up perfectly, uh, this is also a Cal ISO graph, <coughs> but the key piece I call your attention to is the upper left-hand corner. Uh, 20% of our generation is used only 70 hours of the year, and it's important to note that it's not the same 70 hours. It's, it's five minutes here, it's 10 minutes here. Um, but I'm gonna say that again, 20%, that means 20% of every power plant that's out there right now is only used for less than three days of the year. That is not an efficient use of resources, and that means that there are incredible opportunities, whether it's uh, solar or wind or energy storage, to help solve that issue. Next click. The, and the issue here is also not the price of electricity. Uh, we all know that there's plenty of shale gas in the world that's going to help fuel uh, and keep our kilowatt hour prices down. But what most people haven't really figured out yet is that the price of delivering that energy is only going to go up as we continue to urbanize. Uh, imagine how much effort we've had to put into putting high-speed rail into downtown San Francisco Imagine trying to put a new power line through the middle of Stanford all the way through Sand Hill Road through where we're sitting up there. The costs are going to be extreme and with electric vehicles and additional uh, iPads and ITVs coming on the market, this is only going to increase. What this means is that there's a tremendous opportunity and this is being fueled by all the data and the infrastructure that we just talked about that's being deployed. Let's go to the next slide. What we've been able to do by deploying and using a lot of this data, and what you're looking at right here is actually hotel data, not that smooth curve that the utility would normally show you from a load perspective, but actually an incredibly spiky curve. And this is data, uh, actually I'm not sure, we've shown this data outside of this room. This might be the first time we've publicly shown this level of detail. Um, but what you're looking at is an incredibly noisy, incredibly volatile piece of data. This is a single day. What's interesting about it is the green is what's actually happened. The gray is what our algorithms are predicting are going to happen for the rest of the day. And we can predict this within one or two percent by borrowing on the same algorithms and processes that you use in investment trading, that you use in e-commerce to do predictive algorithms for email. Uh, we're using all these same methods borrowed from other industries and bringing them to the utility industry to be a lot smarter about how you use this. Let's go to the next slide. With that information, we've actually deployed an intelligent energy storage system. So imagine a computer, power electronics, and effectively an electric vehicle.
to hybridize a building. The building in the upper right is actually our offices. This is a hybrid building. We've been running now for close to a month on balancing and managing our electricity load without changing anything about how we operate our business. This same type of technology can be deployed across effectively every single stoplight in the U.S. If you think about every hotel, every service station, every fast food joint. And you can use this technology both on a local basis, but jointly you can combine these types of technologies to provide an aggregated resource that you can now go back to the utility and help them balance the issues we just talked about, immediate ramps in the afternoon as your wind drops off, volatility as solar comes on, if it starts to rain or not rain throughout the day. And so what we're looking at is by using smart meter data and using the deployed assets, we're now able to combine that with other industries and other technologies to start delivering immediate benefits to our commercial customers. So great. Thank you, Brian. That was terrific. Why don't we, uh, so let's go into the, the Q&A with the panel now, and then we'll have questions from the audience after that. Why don't we step back uh, one step and just this panel is about the smart grid, and we've seen four presentations on that, but let's define what we think the smart grid means so the audience understands that. Andy, do you have a, do you have a thought on that? Pick on me first, right? <laughs> How we view it, view the smart grid is really, even different people maybe define it in different terms, but it's really a layering of intelligence across the whole value chain. Where we look from the start of the chain being the power generation from the utilities dispatch center, then you go across the high voltage transmission lines, then you drop down into the substation levels, so you get into the distribution layer, and then you start linking into factories and office buildings, and then drop down again into homes and advanced meter structure, interconnecting each one of the homes, and then from the homes inside the home. And, and our view is this is how we not only take advantage of the new technologies from both communications and all the automation and what my friends here to the left to talk about, but also a two-way communication. We used to, it used to be just a pure push. So you would buy your electricity or your gas from a generating station from PG&E, and it was one way. Then we moved to one-way communications that says, okay, now... We have somewhat of a smart meter, so you can say how much have you used. Now as we take this to the next level, it's a two-way communication. So the consumers and the utility know back and forth what's going on, and then you start controlling, whether it's allowing generation from renewables or solar panels or wind farms, or whether you've got your electric vehicle in your garage, or you use smart appliances, turning appliances on and off. Now you get into a whole new world of high-speed communications back and forth and controls. That's how we view a smart grid. Any other perspectives? How does PG&E uh, view this? Is, does, it, does it use that term or is it just your business? Oh yeah, we use smart grid. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, in, in a way, I think that um, smart grid is a term that often is, isn't is as clearly understood and well defined, but I think about it in pretty simple terms, and I think it's pretty much what you just said. It's, you know, to me, the, the electric grid is one of the greatest inventions of all time. Now, I'm in Silicon Valley, so I'm sure someone's going to argue that the internet's better, but I would remind you that it doesn't work without electricity. So, <laughs> so, you know, to me, the grid is one of the greatest inventions ever, but it is fundamentally a pretty dumb asset in compared to, you know, the things we're used to today. And... Smart Grid is all about bringing information to that entire value chain and then using the information to make smarter choices. No different than has been done in the retail supply and logistics uh, industry, no different than has been done in banking, no different has been done in airlines. It's the same core principle that with information you can make much smarter choices at fast, dynamic you know, levels um, and you can achieve better outcomes. From our perspective, it's really split into kind of two big pieces. There's how you run the grid, and then there's how customers use, in, use the energy that comes off the grid, and how you connect a customer to the grid. I mean, fundamentally, electric grid customers, which includes all of us, are not very engaged to how we use energy. Even those of us who are pretty green-minded and think we're very conscious, none of us call the night before and say, you know, my alarm clock's gonna go off at 6.30, can you please have enough electricity for me to turn on all the lights and take a shower? 
That's not how the grid works. We're not very engaged. But information, intelligence, technology can help engage us in ways that is simple for us to do, and the outcome from that can be significant. Lisa, what's your perspective? Is Siemens trying to be the uh, smart grid uh, international company, or what? Yeah, gl globally, absolutely, Siemens would you know love to be that. But I think the thing that uh, Siemens may have recognized that will hopefully set it apart is is the concept of ecosystems and evaluation. So while yes, it would be lovely to be the complete end to end solution provider, I think the thing that has uh, Will, will truly end up setting it apart is realizing there are other great technologies and it is all about how fast can you help enable them and play a key role in that. And so it's the, the central roles, you know, ensuring that um, that the information is really probably our biggest driver right now in understanding that we've got control of that from a grid operations control side or on the IT side of the house. Uh, because if we can do that, we can partner with a number of folks um, Siemens also has great goals in terms of you know, carbon footprints and being a sustainable player in the marketplace. The thing that I think that the smart grid is actually its greatest missing factor um, is because we've called it the smart grid, is it's missing gas and water. So the other two components that are absolutely key, and when you look at how much it is, energy is used even in California, I think it's 20% of all energy in California is used for moving water to different places. And this is not unusual in the world. Spain and Italy and other places face exactly the same concept. Many of the same information challenges are there, sometimes with more difficult things because their meters are under the ground. Right? When you think that one of our biggest things around generation is moving gas and using gas as a you know, means and not coal and nuclear any longer. So we're missing two big pieces when we describe smart grid many times. And so that's something that we're very focused on is while we call it smart grid, it really is about all types of energy sources. Are you addressing all types of energy sources or are you? Yes. Yeah. So Lisa, your and Andy's products are, I think, aimed at the supply side. The customers are the utilities. And Brian, your customers are on the demand side. The customers are end users, commercial uh, companies. So let's talk about the supply side customers first. Everybody uh, doesn't like selling the utilities, right? Isn't that? <laughs> yes, they do. That's what they tell me all the time. <laughs> how have you, how have Lisa and Andy, how have you guys overcome that hurdle? Lisa, you can go first. <laughs> He's close to me. Spill the water. It. Um, it has tested every bit of my selling metal on capabilities, I will tell you that, uh, because the decisions are not always made on traditional buying decisions. Um, but I do think um, it's a case of finding, yeah, it sounds terrible, is it? but it's the case of finding the right customers. Um, it is also an industry that when it sees best practices, follows best practices. Um, so it is finding the innovative players who are partners in many ways in the development process. And it is no different than selling to technology. I've sold to a bunch of different types of clients, but the best customers are those that are also partners with you. Um, and there are key stakeholders in every region of the world. We're, we're now on every continent other than the poles right now. and. It's been by finding and working with those most innovative customers because with that you have a great deal of influence. PG&E makes a move and every municipal, every other company, really every other utility in the United States takes a look seriously at what they're doing because of where they are in the magnitude of your footprint, right? Um, and they set the bar. So it's really finding and working with those. So is it easy? No, but uh, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, so how do I comment on that? So, yes, utilities are very demanding and they're very tough customers, but uh, as, I, as I came to raise capital here in Silicon Valley, and I'm talking to venture capitalists about raising money to sell to utilities, they all complained about how difficult it is in working with utilities, and I said, oh, I work for GE for all my career, that's all I've ever sold to, so it's all degrees of uh, 
who are better or not. But no, they, I think utilities are very pragmatic. They're very engineering oriented from, from their background. But just talk a, a little bit, every utility is not the same. Uh, as Lisa explained, there's some very innovative, leading edge people who go and do smart grid. If you look at North America, almost all of the West Coast has actually moved pretty quickly. The Eastern Seaboard, if you look at the United States right now, I would say probably 50% of the uh, of the U.S. utilities have gone to smart grid, and all a lot of the population is everything from Massachusetts all the way down the Eastern Seaboard have not moved yet. So it's interesting to see the difference. Then when you move internationally, it's very different. You go to the UK where we're at today, it's very different. It's an open competition. You get to pick a utility in the UK. So you can, yeah, you pick your media, you pick whatever. So you have six utilities you can choose from. So you can buy your gas from one guy, you can buy electricity from the other guy, and you can change within two weeks. It's a totally different, it's much more consumer oriented when we're selling to a UK utility than what it is selling to US utility where I think 80-90% of the states are, are a monopoly today. But it's a very different behavior, very different selling. But when I, I, I find utilities to be tough but fair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Playing up to the customer a little bit. <laughs> and he's not my customer. <laughs> my competition. <laughs> Brian, you're selling to commercial businesses. I'm guessing the challenge you face is their energy usage may not be their number one problem. It's a cost issue, it's not a revenue issue for those customers. Are you having trouble getting them to pay attention? We're not selling in Omaha, Nebraska right now because for the most part they have plenty of energy and they, their costs are fairly low. But what we have found is that you know energy costs for most commercial customers is a very well known uh, and very watched issue. If you're a gas station, your margins uh, are extremely low. So you know you're not selling software on an enterprise level. You're selling gasoline that you have, to, you know, somewhere on the order of, of you know three or two percent margins on. If you can save them even a couple thousand dollars a month, that's the equivalent of a half a million dollars in new revenue a year for a gas station. And so this is. Uh, these are significant numbers and they change and they can really change fundamentally what a business looks like in that context. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what is interesting though is that in many ways by selling effectively lower utility bills we are selling in some ways uh, and, and we get confused sometimes and people say well what, what does the utility think? You know, Aren't you just taking money away from the utility? And the reality is, is that when you're an energy optimization company, you're actually helping the utility. And in many ways, I'd argue that for the first time, we're doing exactly what they set out to do, which is they've set out a rate plan that says, we believe that energy, if we price it correctly, that people will behave in the context of how it's priced. And as Steve pointed out earlier, most of the time, energy costs for most residential consumers is so low or that the switching costs to not actually do your laundry at a certain point in time of the day uh, doesn't make sense. But for a commercial customer that you can now actually start to implement technologies that doesn't actually interact with how they run their business but does allow them to interact directly with the grid, effectively allow them to be good energy citizens uh, and also reduce their bottom line becomes a lot more palatable and frankly makes a lot of sense and, and hopefully the utilities will see it the same way. Just just so that I understand, you mentioned that your, your existing building that you've been in for a short period of time is a hybrid building and you're balancing the load. How are you doing that specifically? So, so specifically what we do is we, as we discussed, measure our actual electricity use and we do this on multiple levels, uh, not just at the meter but also on uh, individual branches within the building. In, in using all this data, we combine it uh, with external variables. And so we keep track of when the sun rises and the sun sets, and we know when our lights turn on and off, and we have learning algorithms that keep track of these things day over day. We combine this with an anomaly detection engine. And using all this data, we can now begin to predict what our actual energy use is going to be by tying that in with a very high speed intelligent energy storage system that sits in the back of our warehouse. It's actually very small. It's the size of a small dorm fridge. Uh, it actually will go and add and subtract energy very quickly throughout the day based on when the algorithms tell it to do so. 
And it's doing that based on an economic decision. So it knows when it needs to happen, and in so doing, it changes what the actual perceived energy use is for the building perceived by the grid and reduces our electricity bill. Do your customers of your product need to have that storage capability as well? So all of our customers will need some level of energy storage actually installed at their locations to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, but that's the, the side note of not having to change your operations or behavior, right? We're actually installing equipment that's going to do it for you without you having to think about it. It's kind of like having the perfect employee. You never have to feed it. You never have to think about it. You don't have to tell it what to do. And you don't have to train it. It just sits in the back of the room and does it perfectly. <laughs> uh, Steve, let me ask you. Uh, um, PG&E, you guys are probably have people uh, bringing new products to you all the time from Trillian, Emeter, and other places. What innovations are you guys thirsting for? That's a good question. I mean, I think there's a lot of different things that we're thirsting for. I mean, the problem I kind of laid out before is a big one. And it's um, across multi multiple parts of, of our business and multiple parts of the value chain. Um, you know, on the demand side, which is where I tend to focus most of my time, uh, you know, what we're really trying to, to look for is how do we harvest the information that's now available through smart meter deployments? and you know, pg &E, we have over 9 million smart meters deployed now. We're marching our way through to being almost complete. Um, probably one of, the, one of the first and biggest smart meter deployments in the country, and we have some of the scars to prove it. Um, but, you know, we are now moving from a place where, as I was telling you earlier, we used to bill our customers on 12 million pieces of data. Now we have 87 billion to bill our customers on. We can operate the same way and just have a bigger billing engine that, that runs the bills right but we'd be missing the opportunity to really look at that data and optimize it and connect our customers to energy, but also connect their choices to our system. Um, I think it's gonna be one of the bigger challenges and I, I, won't, I, won't, um, I won't say it's just a technology challenge. Um, the technology is, is really there. I mean, as, as Lisa said, you know, other industries have kind of gone through this before. It's not unknown. The challenge is in the energy industry, there's a lot of policy implications, there's regulatory implications, there's pricing implications, that we have to move that whole model to enable that. So for example, how do I make sure that the customers of STEM can actually be paid and compensated for the value that they're providing to PG&E? Some rate structures make that easy, some rate structures make that harder. Um, we have to figure out how to make sure that the system can compensate uh, value wherever it sits without shifting um, you know an inappropriate value to other customers because at the end of the day pg e has you know 10 million customers we have basically 20 percent of the country's population um, most of whom uh, struggle for different things than we might think about here in the valley in the silicon valley in the other valley in the central valley customers are very concerned about lowering costs they're very concerned about reducing their bills so that they can do other things in their life. They're very concerned with home comfort. Um, those are the issues they have. We need to enable them to be successful as well as the really engaged customer who wants to make a lot of choices and be very engaged to choices every day. Lisa, Steve mentioned that they've got nine million meters installed. Are those a lot of e-meters, meters? They're not a metering company, remember? <laughs> <laughs> we don't make meters. No, they're not. Uh, they're not. We'd love to have those meters at their 15-minute intervals feeding into the e-meter system, but uh, that's a that's a future talk. <laughs> so, so, so who provided those meters? Silver Spring, right? Yeah. We, well, we have. I mean, GE and Landis and Gear are meter manufacturers. They make a meter, which is really no different from a digital meter. We use um, a company called Silver Spring Network that that basically hosts the communication. Uh, for the meter infrastructure we have. And Lisa, do you provide the analytics behind that, or or, or would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> we would love to, and we do so for many other many other customers. And the, the point behind analytics is what do you want to do with it, right? Um, and it's the analytics, as Steve pointed out, you know, uh, the analytics that can go um, for Steve, but also the analytics that can feed the different customers, whether it is the farmer that needs to look at what he's doing from you know, an irrigation system 
um, and his his or her energy usage to you know the person in Palo Alto who's trying to figure out what happens when they come home with their two Teslas or you know and their EVs and what are they going to do when they you know when they plug in right so you know truly the whole enablement of EVs here is going to have a different value proposition and those users actually need to understand what's going on um, as much as Steve does in his particular you know world so yes we'd love to be able to do that we'd love to be enabling it um, but the other thing that we'd love to do is have um, other vendors working with that platform too and building out the very what I call purpose-built applications that we're looking for right I'm very interested in how we work with Steve's technology on his predictive analytics right you can have multiple analytic systems working together side by side to solve for these problems right and we would love to have that Right, in, in the sense we'll that we'll <laughs> one of the challenges with the smart grid is that it's really just a collection of feudal kingdoms. If you think about the access to the data, the types of data, the companies that are providing it, the co companies that are collecting it, the communications, uh, this is not the internet. There is not a single source of uniform data that's being provided across the U.S. or across the globe, right? And, and so in this context, if you are a consumer side or customer side application, you have very hard choices to make between how and when you spend time partnering with people like Silver Springs or Trillion, so you've got access to meter data, uh, or do you spend time developing your own system so that's agnostic enough that it can deploy across multiple utilities? Uh, or do you just pick the largest utilities and hope that there are large enough markets to go after? And so this is it's still a very, very chaotic environment to go after. Uh, and, and we spend a lot of time on our side trying to figure out where to invest our time and energy either in the partnerships or the technology to solve these issues. I think the thing that's important is solving the, uh, the analytics and the data usage throughout the entire value chain, right? And that's what needs to be solved. Relatively speaking, guys, the data we're talking about is not big data. It's big data for this particular industry. It is not big data when you pick up your cell phone and you realize the amount of data and information that's flowing into the world, right? This is truly manageable. Now, what happens is, you know, it oddly enough is more complex data for what it needs to be used for, and that's the business challenge that we're solving for because of the regulators and how they need to do it. In Europe, we have a whole concept of central operators that doesn't exist here, right? We do have a mixed model of deregulated states and regulated states, and how is that? And energy trading platforms that we're dealing with, right? So we have much more complexity with how that data is going to be used and by whom, but the relative volume? Nah, not, not at 15, not even at one minute intervals, right? These guys are doing SCADA data in real time. You know, constant. This is not insurmountable, but it's how it's being used and being put in new and innovative ways, which is what we're talking about. It is what are the new business models? Things have got to fundamentally change in the whole business model, the regulatory environment, right? There's not enough incentives yet for the regulatory guys to make it easier for people like PG&E to change those rates. It's got to be simpler. Is there a concept of dynamic pricing that is happening, or? Um, yes, there absolutely is. So uh, in California, you know, part of the part of the driver for installing these smart meters was to enable dynamic rates for all of our customers, um, and there's tremendous value there. Um, we have uh, all of our largest commercial and industrial customers that are on dynamic time varying rates. Uh, this year, we'll be defaulting about half of our small business customers to time of use rates. Uh, the, the other half will go next year. Residential customers will soon um, also be seeing more both time of use rates and critical peak rates, which is the kind of rate structure where only on a few days of the year where temperatures are the hottest or loads are the highest would you send uh, more significant pricing signals. I will say though, when it comes to dynamic rates, one of the big challenges is that the, the path is really important. The path we go down is really important. And California, we have been going down a path, uh, which I think most of the country has traditionally believed is the right one, to default all customers from a rate that looks like a flat rate or some other type of structure to a time varying rate. But I will say that some of those scars I talked about from smart meter deployment, um, we've learned a few things. We made a lot of mistakes when we went out deploying smart meters. We thought, you know, we're just changing a meter on a house. We do that all the time. We always go out and change a meter. Um, we didn't think it'd be a very big deal.
for most of our customers to to put in a meter um, that is you know that has intelligence. It's basically just measuring it more and it's communicating differently. And unfortunately, when we started to see concerns from our customers, we didn't always hear those concerns for the real issues that stood behind them. And I think at the end of the day, the big lesson for me out of smart meters is that customers want to have a choice. Um, fundamentally, customers want to have a choice about things that are being done to them. We had uh, significant concerns um, from customers that expressing an interest to not get a smart meter. When we actually gave them a formal choice, far fewer of those customers actually chose to not get a smart meter. The choice is an important characteristic. And now as we look to how are we going to deploy pricing options, I think we have to avoid making the same kinds of mistakes. There are a lot of customers out there who, as I said, don't want to choose to engage to energy price. And what we're learning is, no matter what pricing structure you have, if customers don't want to engage, you won't see the benefits of that pricing structure. The niche here is to offer customers information and pricing structures that drive value and give them a choice to participate. And if they want to choose to do it, they can deliver huge value. If they don't want to choose to do it, putting them onto it is just going to make them angry. Um, and that doesn't help us in the long term to really move this problem forward. So from our perspective, dynamic rates are great when customers choose them and when they engage to them, when they choose to participate they can work, uh, work great benefit for the, company, for, the, for the whole system. What were the concerns you mentioned on the smart meter? Is that privacy? Is that the primary issue? Um, we saw many variations of concerns. I think in the beginning there was a concern about accuracy of the meters. Um, we had, uh, at the same time, several things that were changing in our base rate structure. And I'll just be uh, honest with you all, California residential rate structures are among some of the most complicated in the country. Uh, and they frankly are not... Um, well, I think I, I'm, I think I'm not being uh, unfair when I say they're pretty broken right now. The structure itself is fundamentally um, not working. At that time, customers were seeing significant increases in their bills, and they attributed that to the meter. It actually really wasn't the meter. It was the fact that the marginal rate they were paying was very high, and small changes in their usage could drive big changes in their bill. But that created uncertainty about accuracy. We had to move past that concern. The second level of concern that then emerged was actually around RF and concerns about the health effects of RF. And I will say that you know I think this is an issue that um, many industries are going to have to grapple with. Um, you know I've seen many customers who are very passionate and feel um, deeply concerned about the health effects of RF, and telling them that don't worry, a government agency has certified it as safe is not an adequate answer. Um, it is not an adequate answer. And we have to address that concern and enable them um, you know, to, to have a choice about what's going to happen. It's a very complicated, difficult problem, but it was one of the big ones. Privacy, I think, is actually one of the emerging issues that we're going to have to be very careful about. When you get down to you know, really granular data, one second kind of data off a smart meter, I, you know, someone will know when you turn a stove on or when you turn a light on, or when you, your air conditioner turns I mean, you can know just about everything about how someone's using energy when you start to look at one second data. And we need to always be mindful of the fact that um, customers have to choose to engage at that level, and we have to be very careful about protecting privacy issues when we start to move to that place. With all that, one last pg &E question for now. With all that data that's being generated, are you guys like the biggest uh, employer of data scientists at this point, or is that? I think, think, you know, as Lisa Lisa said, not a lot of data. this really is not a lot of data in the grand scheme of things. For us, it's a bit intimidating and scary, um, but it's really not a problem that can't easily be solved. It's, um, it, it, some of the challenge for us with large data is that the other systems that sit around it aren't necessarily built to utilize that big data, you know, billing systems, uh, grid operating systems, and we have to, to bring them into a world where they now have a lot more data exchange but it's really not a lot of data in the grand scheme of things. It's more about you know recognizing how we use it that I think is the big issue. Lisa and Andy, when you guys sell uh, to utilities, do you run into regulatory issues? When you sell a big product, do you need clearance each time? Or um, well, in the selling process, no. But we but we obviously have to comply with all the standards, FCC standards, uh, and things like that. But uh, 
you know, we typically are in a competitive environment, so when a utility comes out to a tender, they will tender to multiple different people. We will provide a proposal back to that particular utility, and then they will make a selection based on commercial and technical rationale. But then within that, we're obliged to comply to all applicable codes and standards, environmental health and safety, FCC standards, etc. And is that a nightmare because you got global and local and, and uh, all sorts of standards to comply with? It's, uh, it's a challenge for my MIT graduate in the back here, runs my engineering <laughs> group, but uh, he's got it all under control. <laughs> but yeah, there are different standards throughout the world, and sometimes the US standards, which are very different in many cases than some of the international standards. You have to deal with international standards bodies and you also have to deal with individual country requirements. So it is a tremendous challenge for our engineers and for our developers to come up with different meter standards, applications, communications requires, different power wattage required. So for example, in the United States, we're allowed to do one watt radios. In certain countries, we can only do 10 milliwatt radios. There's certain frequency bands are allowed in one country. So for example, the United States allows 902.4. In certain other countries, 900 is not allowed. It's taken up by cell carriers. So every different country and region is very different, which provides a big challenge on, on my engineering team. For us, it's, a, it's not actually on our engineering team. What's the interesting part for us is we're, you know, for us, it's, uh, the demand for the utilities to potentially change or if they're going to hold back. So or Germany right now, while they're under a massive EU you know, 2020 um, ruling, Germany itself, from their own regulators, has made no decisions yet. And so you have massive, massive utilities um, that are holding back on making decisions on technologies until the regulators take their stand. Um, and that's going to cause a really tight flow, you know, in the middle once they make their decision. Uh, the benefit, uh, one of the things that we do is the benefit uh, for utilities is because the regulations are changing so much, we've actually built into the system the ability to, to easily change business rules. So, for instance, I was in uh, Sweden a few weeks ago and the CIO came in all just Beside herself, she said, "We've just been told we've, you know, we've got to change from hourly to 30-minute intervals on data, you know, by middle of October. So it was in, you know, early late September. I was at this, and she was in absolute panic. I <laughs> said, so, um, it's not a problem. You fortunately have our system. You need to change a few parameters inside the system, and you're going to be able to deal with this.' And so, but it was a very big sh shift and, you know, panic point." For her and so the systems again that manage the information have to be able to deal with the regulatory changes we have to accept that they're going to change and we hope they change significantly and continually and ideally faster than they have in the past and i think that's actually the biggest uh, heartache from technology companies is regulators just never move as fast as you want them to right it's not normally utilities that are frustrating for us it's the regulators on the other side of them that are holding everything back is, is part of your business uh, to, to recommend standards and to influence the regulatory process? or is yeah, we, we take a very active role in that. We, uh, Chris King is our chief regulatory officer, and I would argue he's one of the fathers of uh, regulations inside of uh, not only the U.S. government, but we've just started a whole demand response coalition in, uh, in Europe that is probably one of the most influential uh, bodies in Belgium right now that's uh, driving a tremendous amount of change. We just need to be involved. Again, starting the conversations is about education as much as it is anything else. So yeah, we try to play a very active role in just things to consider when they're making decisions. This sounds like a business for big tech companies as opposed to uh, venture-backed startups ultimately. Is that why you guys sold out to Siemens or, or no? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have wine with dinner, thank goodness. Um, so, no, it's, uh, I actually would argue just the opposite. Um, the innovation that is needed needs to come, in many cases, from the venture back companies, right? It's the blessing that there are big companies like Siemens that can sometimes pull many of those pieces together to, to make it uh, a more interesting offering. 
um, and easier for the customers to buy, frankly, um, in many ways, so they're not making lots of little independent choices. But no, I would argue, you know, I'm a, I'm a Silicon Valley brat in that way, but I do believe that there's a tremendous amount of innovation. Um, the benefit is when somebody like Siemens can pull it together into, you know, a seamless vision, and ultimately, you know, we're working very hard with, you know, three other platforms inside of Siemens right now to standardize those data models to make it easy for the customer. That's the biggest thing. I would uh, I would argue that uh, many times the big technology companies, the Oracles and SAPs, um, are going to make it more complex than it needs to be. Brian, do you compete with any of the big guys, or is this an area that that you've got with other? Who are, who are your competitors? You know, right right now, you know, our market is is really bifurcated along two lines. There's a lot of people trying to use what's called green button or interact data. It's probably one of the best things that the U.S. government has done in the last year, which is open up all the smart meter data to the individual consumers so you can go get your own 15-minute data if you have a smart meter. Um, and there's a lot of companies who are coming out of the internet space trying to figure out what to do with this data right now. It's effectively free data. They didn't have to put any hardware out there. They didn't have to collect it. Um, but as a consumer, as either a business or a residential con uh, consumer electricity, you have access to this and, and you can start to do some interesting things. Um, and so we have people thinking about data and, and, and companies in that space who are starting to think about analytics and how to provide useful information back to businesses. But for the most part, they're, they're still thinking about in terms of, boy, did you know that you left your lights on all night last night? And if you Did you realize your refrigerator or door was open uh, or that your team forgot to do inventory, and, and you can see this type of data in the Interact data. On the other side, you know, we have big companies, Samsung, Toshiba, BYD, uh, who are making batteries, and lots of them, and trying to figure out how to, and what to do with these batteries, and most of them are trying to store energy at night and discharge it during the day to either help see with their solar issue, if they can't turn it off, and uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do with all these batteries. And so what we're watching right now in real time is a brand new market trying to converge. I think we're one of the few people that have actually bridged the gap between the two of them, but we expect to see some others to start doing that in the near future. Andy, who, do, who does Trilliant uh, compete with? It's a little different depending on geography, but uh, in the United States, uh, Probably the largest single competitor is Silver Spring Networks, right next door to us. So we're all here, big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> we also compete with several of the meter guys who actually are communications technology guys as well as uh, meter people. So those kind of guys, we let's say we compete in the morning and then we partner in the afternoon. Hopefully when we win, we partner. And, and so they're the typical media guys like Itron, Landis and Gear, Census. Those are, are kind of our competitors in the United States. Once you get outside the United States and you get out of ANSI world and into IEC world, it's a different set of competitors. Because most of the competitors here in the United States operate on different frequency bands. So it's, it's a different view of competition and actually different technologies. We, we compete mainly in the United States on RF mesh, private network, some public network, so the utility owns its own private network, operates it. When you go into the UK, for example, it's all on public network, so they use the carriers like similar to AT&T, but O2, Vodafone, etc. And we see a different set of competitors there who deal in, in that kind of technology. And then as you move into Southern Europe and Asia, you see a lot of power line carrier technology. A lot of local players, people like um, you know Chinese uh, suppliers, uh, Taiwanese suppliers. You see some of the U.S. suppliers like Echelon. So very different depending on the country and the regulations. But uh, so uh, very challenging and competitive environment. So is PG&E uh, willing to deal with smaller companies as vendors in this area? Absolutely. Um, many of the companies that are now bigger started off very small when they worked with us and uh, got bigger. Um, I, I think that you know the recognition is is we're out looking for ideas. Um, the ideas can come from both. It can come from bigger companies. It tends to be you know bigger companies can come and say, here's my core offering and here's how I can make it a little better. Um, I think what you often see with smaller companies, sort of the point Lisa was making earlier, that 
that's, that's the environment where you can rethink the problem from a bigger perspective um, and bring something totally new. And as the ecosystem develops, you know, that can link into the bigger companies where it needs to be. It can link into more small companies. Um, you know, from our perspective, there are certain things that we're obviously very concerned about. Um, as a company that's got to serve, you know, those 10 million customers every day, we want to really make sure that our partners um, can be there, that they have the financial stability, that they're going to be around, that they're going to help us and kind of grow as we deploy these systems. Um, but at the same time, that's just a that's just a thing we check off along the way. It's not a, a limiting. It's not that we'd say you, know, you got to have certain revenue before you can come talk to us. If that would have been our test, we would have missed a lot of great ideas. What about on the legislative side? Is there anything like there is in the solar and wind with tax credits that's sort of pending out there or should be adopted that is really necessary to drive the industry, or is, or is inaction better than action? I'll, I'm not sure here. I'll, I'll try something. I mean, I, I think that you know some of the things you've heard everybody kind of allude to here. The the environment in energy is a very complicated one. It's not even that we in the United States. It's not even that we have 50 different energy market structures, because just within California alone, you've got the investor-owned utilities, you've got the munis, you've got you know co-ops, um, all of whom have very different structures, very different policies. That is a problem that I think has been addressed or has been raised, I'm sorry, not addressed, raised in many different forms. You know, how do you get wind power from Wyoming to California? Don't even, you know, it's a pretty tough one. I don't think that's gonna be easily solved. If it could be easily solved, it would've been solved a long time ago. Smart grid's not gonna be the thing that pushes it over the top. But I do think um, if we can move forward on some common things, you know, uh, we mentioned the green button. Brian mentioned the green button earlier. Uh, pg &E, all of you who are pg &E customers, go online, sign up on our My Energy page, push the green button, you can get all your data, you can do with it whatever you want. These types of things, enabling that type of ecosystem and infrastructure is really critical. Um, I would love to have more standards. I would love to have standards, very clean, good standards on how home area networks are going to work. I would love to have standards on you know, EV charging protocols across the country. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, we need to just work through as best we can and kind of overcome the challenges as they happen. Brian, I'm going to say something radical. You know, most of the time when you hear solar guys or wind guys get up and talk about incentives, the, the thing that they will always tell you is, is the level of uncertainty around how long they'll be around make them tend to be very difficult to either finance or trust or even be able to plan around, certainly not raise money uh, and survive long enough assuming they'll be here. Um, but when you think about the smart grid and incentives, you know, we tend to think about incentives as these very large, all-encompassing things that tend to kind of encompass either the amount of solar that's produced or the amount of wind that's produced, kind of irregardless of where it's produced. Uh, and, and with the smart grid, you now have the ability to start to really understand usage patterns on a very specific localized pattern. And so as you see, uh, places like Palo Alto and Berkeley take higher EV penetration and have higher requirements for different types of load. The ability to provide very localized incentives based on smart meter data uh, and smart grid uh, data now starts becoming a practical reality. Now, whether the, uh, the PUCs or the regulators are going to be able to take advantage of that uh, and do something is unclear, but, but the, the ways of thinking about incentives are now going to change as well as we move into the next decade or two. I think it's going to be, again, attacking both ends of the value chain, right, from the consumer side, whether it's the businesses or the consumers that can allow the utilities then to actually better manage um, the renewables they already have, right? The hardest thing has got to be for the utilities industry is to turn off those wind turbines every day, right? And it's just having to happen because there's not enough fixed on the consumer and on the CNI side yet to actually allow this to be balanced. And so there's a whole, you know, there's a technology, you know, there's technology and patterns that needed to be developed there. But on the flip side, there's things that need to happen that haven't even begun to be, you know, touched or if they have, they haven't come out yet, is how to begin to manage that throttle and putting that information back to the grid so you can actually start to, you know, whether it's get it from Wisconsin to here or get it from any, you know, anywhere else so you don't overload and break down, you know, the whole distribution network, right? So 
Um, there, there's technologies and, and things that need to happen on both sides of it. Um, and it's not going to be solved at once, but again, I think it is the phenomenal opportunity for the industry. Just to add to that, because I think you hit on a good point. I mean, there already are incentives out there in the marketplace. You know, right now, today, in the uh, California Independent System Operator and the wholesale market, there are negative prices at night. Negative prices. You're paying people to shut off power plants. Now, the problem actually is how do you get that negative price signal to someone who's going to do something about it? The Cal ISO um, wholesale market is built for very big generators to interact in the system. It's not built for you to you know, get a pricing signal and, and somehow receive that benefit as an individual consumer. The structures, uh, the regulatory structures on how we set rates um, and how we pass that value through between the utility and the wholesale and to the retail is where part of the challenge is. But that really is the key. If we can make the total cost to run the system less, there's plenty of incentive out there to drive adoption. It's just getting the value you know, to the provider. How about security? Did, do any of your companies address security issues, or do you just leave that to security-specific companies? Uh, well, we, we live on security, because the communication networks, whether you're using public or private networks, whether we're talking cybersecurity attacks on the grid level stuff, so we don't want any hackers to be able to get into our communication network, to be able to open and close circuit breakers, cause mass outages, transformer problems, etc. have to be really controlled, encryption, double keys, etc. So only the utility guys can get in there. So we have experts that, uh, that my team employ within the company and outside of the company on the cybersecurity cracks for the, for the, you know, the grid level and distribution level, but also for data protection and privacy for the people. want to make sure that the data that you have up to and including when you're home, I think it was mentioned before, that if you can see a load profile of a person's home, any thief would know that that person whose typical load pattern looks like this when they get up on the morning and they cook breakfast and then they're not there and they see that load pattern people in the wrong hands could detect that information and know that person's not at home for two weeks and in the hands of thieves and things like that. But uh, we're a critical part of that uh, security infrastructure and, uh, and we have to comply with very stringent requirements for the utilities and also help protect the consumers. I, I would argue this is, this is truly one of the benefits of having gone into Siemens, right? So our ability and understanding of this problem um, and how to drive the consistency of it all the way from the substations to the consumer is something that, uh, you know, Siemens has phenomenal teams that are working at that and have solved it on the mission critical systems and now it's how do you solve it in some more of the IT systems. Again, the balance there is keeping a level of op openness while at the same time being able to provide the security to those that need it. Um, but uh, that, that was one of the benefits. As a, as a small company, um, we would not have had access to that level of engineers, knowledge, talent, and technologies that we can now take advantage of. We solve that issue by minimizing the number of points where we have to deal with security, right? And so unlike E-Meter or Trillium, where you have literally thousands and thousands of, of potential intersection points where you have to concern yourself with gateways uh, to get into your systems. We, we spend a lot of time minimizing the number of points and entry points where you can even get into our systems. And so by minimizing the number of things that you can talk to, uh, we hopefully reduce the security uh, overhead that we have to take on. And I, from our side uh, at the utility, security is a huge, huge uh, issue. And it is absolutely foundational for anything that we're going to go do. As you were just saying, Andy, I mean, on the grid side, it's extraordinarily important. Um, how we really make sure we're managing the, the system to ensure protection of the physical infrastructure and the grid, you know, all the way from uh, power plants all the way through to your home is incredibly important. But just as important is how do we make sure we have good customer data security? Um, and I think this is one of the issues with, with openness, you know, at the moment we're sort of at the point where a customer can, um, if they so choose, they can take their data and do whatever they want with it. Obviously, it's their data. Uh, but as we move into a world where customers are going to make a choice to open their data to, you know, a broader environment, 
I think we also are going to have to be thinking about what happens with that data once it's gone, and are they really aware of it? Um, is a single certification kind of enough? Are we really clear as a customer, you know, what this data is going to be used for and where it's going to go? The entire industry has to address that issue, or it will really uh, hinder our, our ability to move forward. Great. One last question for the panel before we go to the audience. What do each of you worry about late at night about your business? What are the biggest challenges or concerns or uh, the real tough parts uh, right now? Start with you, Brian. Disadvantage being on the front of the road. Um, you know, we're a small company and, and we are looking at an incredibly large market opportunity. We have a huge first mover advantage. And then the things that keep me up at night is how fast can you scale without taking a, a small venture back startup and running it over a cliff accidentally. And uh, just, just you know, the realities of raising money and going out into uh, you know, what is traditionally a social media uh, environment, right? And if you can go make Angry Birds, you can go get funded tomorrow. Um, and, and we get to go out and talk about big data and you know in a utility driven space and that's not always the most exciting conversation to have with venture capital uh, people on Sand Hill. Uh, the good news is that we've got a very exciting story and, and as we get out and start talking to people we've had a lot of feedback and, and uh, that. The, the only other thing I would tell you is is finding quality people to build teams around. Uh, I know that you guys all deal with this in your daily lives but I can't tell you how important it is uh, the first 10, 20, 30, 40 people you hire uh, have a, an echo effect across the rest of your organizations. And so that's the other thing I spend probably 50% of my time on day in and day out is making sure that we have the best and brightest possible people we can have in our organizations uh, to help make sure we can scale appropriately. Lisa. Mine's twofold. One is interesting because it piggybacks on um, what was just said. It's mine's keeping that core talent that I had, right? Um, so obviously the transition from the size of company that eMeter was coming into Siemens, right, is a huge um, thing and helping, you know, my entire team recognize the opportunity that's there so that we can keep the innovation. And that leads into the next um, thing is the opportunities and the development and the partners. Um, it is keeping up with that demand um, and keeping the 100% customer satisfaction that we have growing at the pace that we're growing. We view every customer as a partner, and it's how do you do that and sizing and scaling um, the way that we now have the opportunity to do. I think for me it's uh, market and economics. Uh, as many of the first movers went in North America, started off really with Canada and then the West Coast, people were pioneers, they moved very quickly in the market. Then we had this stimulus package for, for Smart Grid, which really helped some of the people that were on the fence. And we've had really a slowdown in, in North America, primarily on the East Coast. So there's a, a lot fewer deals coming forward today with a lot of competition. So North America, from a market perspective for us, has slowed down tremendously. The international opportunity is tremendous, but it's just a matter of timing for us. So when I wake up, it's about how do I compensate for the shrinkage, let's call it. I think the North American market will eventually go, but the timing of that versus how fast the international business ramps in that market is, is my key challenge. How do I manage the economics in the low in North America versus how fast the international guys will go? You know, for me, um, back in 2010, PG&E faced some tremendous challenges. First with consumer reaction to marginal rates that had gotten too high. Um, and then in September of 2010, uh, with the explosion that happened in San Bruno and the recognition that our system uh, needs to first and foremost be the safest system in the world for our customers. That's what they deserve. So I come full circle back to where I started, which is our mission is safe, reliable, and affordable. Um, we have a huge reinvestment in the infrastructure nationally and, and within PG&E that has to be done. We're going to be dealing with a grid that's much more complex, much more difficult to run. Um, and I am very focused on how do we make sure the innovations, the creativity, the things we're bringing into the grid are all focused on safe, reliable, and affordable. How do we do things that are going to help drive down the cost of our energy system 
not drive it up. Because I go back to the very first chart. In California, we have a legacy of driving um, great uh, environmental policies, great energy policies that can lead the nation. We have to bring those policies to bear such that safe, reliable, and affordable is our future as well as our past. If we do that right, I think the market's going to take off. If we do it wrong, um, you know, we won't be having smart grid panels here because we'll all have failed. Uh, so I think we have a big obligation, and this is the thing that keeps me up at night, is how do we, how do we move this market forward so that it's safer, that it's more reliable for every one of our customers, and that we bring down the cost of energy over time? Because um, frankly, at the end of the day, customers have other things to do with their money than just paying for energy. That's great. So that uh, that ends that portion of the panel. Any questions from the audience? There's a microphone there. By That's the way, if anybody knows of a lot of great job engineers, I have a lot of great openings. <laughs> <laughs> My question is going to be on how smart are the smart meters right now? Uh, I understand through the green button function you talked about or the PG&E customer interface. As a PG customer, I have access to my data 24 hours later. So my question to you, Steve, is why not in real time for other smart devices? My question to you, Andy, I think some of the smart devices actually have two ports, one for the utility, and one where it work for the uh, the end user. And so why is that why is that, that second port is not on? And if it's not in the US, is it open to you know, other countries? Um, let me start with the timing. So I think one of the big issues with smart meter data is we also go through a process when that data comes back in in which we basically clean the data. So if it's missing an interval, we can estimate based on reading between two meter, between two intervals. Um, that we can sort of clean up the data so that it's really reflective of you know what you're actually using. Um, so that process is what we cycle through first, and then we present the data back. Now, as we move to home area networks, which we are deploying, we've got uh, our first 500, and throughout 2013, we're going to be opening up that opportunity for customers to interact through the home area network. You see real-time data um, on how it's coming straight off your meter, and I think that's the the channel that that will happen through. Yeah, the answer is the capability is that, I and mean, it's really up to utilities and the consumers whether they use it or not. So real-time communication is two-way with the port capability is there. Uh, you asked about which other countries uh, are doing that. Canada is a perfect example. The province of Ontario decided to do it across the province. So all of Ontario right now does full time of use, two way, critical key pre-pricing, time of use, etc. Uh, in the UK, everybody in the UK will have a smart meter by mandate by 2019. And every home in the UK right now is deployed with a smart gas meter, smart electric meter, a communications hub, which my team's developed, and uh, an in-home display and control panel within there. So the technology is there, it's capable. We put the pipes in, and then it's really up to the utility when and how they want to engage with their consumer to use it. This one's for Brian. Uh, how many kilowatt hours per person, per square foot, per meter amp do you need to get your system to work in, a, in an office building? <laughs> 17, I think. <laughs> That's like an electric car. You know, the, this is, um, and, and we get into the IP and other things like that. You know, one of the biggest challenges we have in talking about our systems is that we tend to use a lot less energy storage than what other people would typically use given the nature of our systems. We just know when it's going to be used, uh, and so therefore we don't overshoot uh, and, and use it when it's not necessary. This conversation is also a lot like solar panels. So you know, if you ask me how many square feet per person, per whatever, how many solar panels would you need to go power that with the added complexity of a car wash looks very different than an office building that looks very different than a hotel, right? So what I will tell you is, is for a hotel, uh, you know, somewhere on the order of 50 to 100 kilowatt hours for a typical hotel uh, would be in the ballpark of what we're looking at. How many rooms in the hotel? <laughs> 120. How many? 120. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. Uh, power industry 
culture and mindset has been for last 50 years the race covers slow moving safe reliable while internet culture on the other side standardization fast moving risk taking communication networks and all that we have grown in the very last 50 years like that my question then is in a smart power grid you are mixing two culture and mindset how fast it will happen it will take number of years first to change the mindset and culture or it will happen faster any estimate <laughs> well, let me, so let me say this. I do think, and I would be the first to acknowledge that I think in the energy industry, uh, the culture has been more, is more risk averse, and is slower. And there's a good reason for that. Um, unless we don't have many people who volunteer to be on the grid that we're going to go test everything on and take a lot of risks on reliability. We also, in this industry, have a, a history of making very you know, large capital investments uh, that are long-lived assets that you know, when you're making an investment decision about building a large generating plant or putting $2 billion into a smart meter infrastructure, you, know, you really want to make sure you're making the right decision before you do that. Um, I will say that I don't think, so I'll, number one, I'll tell you, I don't think it's going to happen anywhere close to, uh, to internet speed. Obviously, otherwise, it'd all be done by now. But I do think that we need to take the best of both of those cultures and marry them together and recognize that each brings some significant advantage. Now, I know that's difficult in the venture world, where things, uh, you know, we're looking to really happen faster. Um, but I would say, you know, there is great opportunity that has been moved forward. And I think, you know, companies like PG&E have adopted a lot of new um, ideas, technologies, and innovations, and brought them forward. We're continuing to move them forward. I know everybody would like to go faster, but for us, it feels like we're moving pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> Well, I feel uniquely qualified to answer this question, given my recent acquisition, um, because a lot of people would describe Siemens the same way they describe the utility. Um, but um, it's, you know, and I agree, it's not going to happen at the speed at which uh, internet does, but that's going to protect us from having pets.com, right? Um, it's going to protect... Careful, careful on that, that's one of our clients. <laughs> Way back when. No, that was, it was back in 99. Can I go back to utilities.com if anybody remembers that? Um, so, um, you know, just because it's fast doesn't necessarily make it better. And there's been a few IPOs in this year that have made that, you know, apparent to in business models that we all thought would do something different. So um, I would argue that it gives us a little bit more time to think through some of these things, but the, again, the innovation is going to happen throughout. It is not only on the IT side of the, this house. There are going to be real technological advances that are happening throughout the grid um, that need equal amounts of attention. Um, but where it will, in some cases, move at internet speed is around the information, right? So once it's in there, because that can be a protected source, you can do that and sort of play with that in an area that doesn't necessarily destabilize the grid. So I think you're gonna see a tremendous amount of innovation around the, the information that's available, um, whether it's publicly or not publicly. We're watching a number of utilities um, incubate, if you will, some phenomenal ideas you know, around things like e-curtailment and some other you know, programs, interesting demand response programs, where they're just modeling in the background and incubation and getting ready for it to come out, but lots of interesting things going on. Yeah, we believe that the technology is there. This is the energy internet as far as we're concerned. I think the, the, the key topic is how fast you can adopt. With the internet, you can make quick changes, and whether you're changing your laptop or making an investment in a new iPhone and the other things is very different than a utility who says they're making a billion dollar decision because they just can't quickly switch out a trillion network. They're making a major investment for 10, 20 years and not for a one to two year program. So I, I believe the technology is there. Speed is up to the utilities and the individual countries and some are moving faster than others. I, I recently read a paper about an enterprise smart grid 
So the question is, uh, are you selling to enterprises for, for improving their energy efficiency and what sort of uh, outcomes you are seeing uh, with respect to enterprises using these smart grid technologies? So um, SEEM as at large is, there's a whole building um, controls division, um, actually the E-meter organization is just starting to work with this particular organization uh, where we're going to see a lot of that begin to come together in the levels of information. So um, if you look, um, New York City is one of Siemens at large greatest success stories from uh, a transformation on the grid, um, has a, the largest what I'll call smart city in the world um, that's out there. And so it is absolutely uh, happening in business results. And that's because of all the businesses in New York and the, and the work that was done there. So um, we're just embarking on that. Um, we're seeing it start to happen in microgrids. You're seeing it start to happen on campuses. So um, I don't have a lot of the answers for you yet. If you'll check back with me in somewhere between six and 12 months, I think I'll have a whole different story for you. Hi. Uh, so we've heard a lot today about the consumption side. We heard a lot about smart meters and the such. There's also another uh, whole group of uh, smart grid uh, technologies that affect the production side and the distribution side. And uh, I was wondering, and it's mostly a question for Steve, I guess, but anyone on the panel, how is that progressing? So all the you know uh, synchrophasers, advanced monitoring, uh, advanced automation, and whether the um, you know, the really low natural gas price that we have now and the, you know, the, therefore the um, uh, large uh, gas turbine capacity that can switch on like that has affected that. Um, I, I can speak for pg and &E. I'm not sure I can really speak broadly for the industry on that side, but I would say that that is an extremely important part of what Smart Grid is for us. It is about enabling technology all the way back through the value chain to the supply side. And I think it's a big part of the answer up there. You know, we are bringing on synchrophasers. We are trying to bring on more of the self-healing grid so that we can do automated switching to enable you know, the grid to self-heal to give a better customer experience and a more reliable experience. Um, I think that the, the challenge on the grid side is that different regulatory markets have very different structures and incentives. Uh, so in each different market, you're gonna probably see different answers, unfortunately. The, the, the thing that I think we have going for us as an industry, despite all those um, different regulatory markets, is that regardless of the regulatory market you're in, every utility around the country is asking themselves the question, how are we going to rebuild the grid that is aging and that needs tremendous investment? So the challenge we really have is not to um, demonstrate the value of installing a piece of equipment. It's just to demonstrate the value of making that piece of equipment a little bit smarter. And I think that that's really the, the burning platform that's gonna help drive adoption on the grid side for smart grid. We have to basically put in that stuff anyway. And, and the technology is there, maybe we didn't talk about it as much, but on the grid side and, and things like voltage, VAR control, how do you use the best use of generation closest to the power use source, all that capability is there. Uh, the other tools that you could use is outage detection and restoration, maybe somewhat more appropriate up in Canada or in the Northeast as an example we've put in the state of Maine. You know, right now in the state of Maine, anybody who has a smart meter or that capability uh, can actually detect my house. They don't have to have people calling up my streets, uh, my houses, uh, et cetera. They have detection right down to every individual house so they can dispatch crews automatically to go and get outage restoration done quicker, quicker, better, faster, and then before outage restoration is outage detection. How do you detect where this particular line may go out in some overcurrent situation and you can reroute and redo? So the technology is actually there. Many utilities are using it. In fact, some of the utilities are driving their entire business case around vault, VAR, control on the grid side. I have an eye chart for you that I'm happy to sit down with you and talk to you about. I'm the innovations that Siemens doing on all sides of the house, and I tried to save it tonight, A, because I can't explain it all personally. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are a tremendous amount of innovations that, that are going on um, all the way through the supply chain that I think they're great opportunities. But again, I would have, you know, I don't want to be dismissive of it. I'd be happy to have a follow-up conversation, not only with myself, but some other folks that uh, can actually explain it in more detail and make it more valuable for you. 
Yes, well, um, my question is about uh, wind power and its effective use. And we, you know, you, you discuss the negative pricing that occurs for the system at night. We've kind of alluded to curtailment of wind generators at various times. So I don't know what's the best measure of that use, but what fraction of wind power would you say right now is ineffectually used, such that if we found ways to get it on the grid more, it would be more easily used? And, and do you see that fraction growing or shrinking in the future where we get larger penetration of wind, maybe it'll grow even greater, or will the technologies the previous you know, questioner asked about make it small? Um, I, I think on wind, there's a couple things. I think you're going to see different answers in different parts of the country because the wind profile is very different. In California, generally the wind profile is nighttime peaking, um, which is why we see, I don't actually know the answer to the question of what percentage is really kind of ineffectively used. You know, generally wind power capacity factors for plants are in the 25 to 35 kind of percent range. And if you can get into 40, you're, you're in great shape. Unfortunately, usually nobody lives where it's blowing at 40% of the time. Um, so, so that's an inherent challenge. I, I think that the big issue for wind power really is similar for solar. Um, you know, we saw in that chart earlier, right, that solar is causing the net load to actually be troughing during the middle of the day, which is very different for all of us. The question is, how do we connect the demand side to the load side so that you have more options available when there's more power available? There's no reason in the world why every um, ice maker in California at a commercial level should be, gen should be generating ice in the middle of the night and storing it during the middle of the day. No reason in the world why that can't happen and that takes that wind power and provides an opportunity for it. Electric vehicles, no reason in the world why electric vehicles shouldn't be plugging in and charging at night when we have negative prices. Um, those negative prices will disappear very quickly um, when we can bring in and connect the load to the demand and I think that's going to be the really critical part for both wind and solar. I'm going to add to that, probably more interesting for us because we've been actually tracking that on our side because it plays into our business model. When we started this four years ago, uh, we were seeing negative pricing on a quarterly basis on a PG&E. Uh, a year later, we were seeing it on a monthly basis. Uh, last year was on a weekly basis, and this year we're seeing it on a daily basis. So this is not a problem that's. Uh, I worry about how do we solve it. I'm wondering how do we keep it from getting worse and, and hoping to be one of those solutions. I, uh, I hate to bring up an unpleasant topic, but uh, I recently noticed that we're in the middle of a, an election year. And um, <clears throat> I was wondering, if, and on one side of the political, well, our two-party system, we have complaints about regulation. On the other side, we have uh, a stimulus program that is sort of already run its course, um, and uh, expectations that if uh, Obama is reelected, that he would push for infrastructure and, and more stimulus money. Um, and if uh, Romney is, is uh, elected, uh, we'd have less regulation. Are there any aspects of either the regulatory system or um, infrastructure and stimulus um, that would affect your businesses? Uh, I'm not asking for an endorsement, but just <clears throat> on, on those two issues, regulatory issues and, and, and stimulus. And the stimulus question is also retrospective as to how it affected you uh, when it was actually uh, geared up. Stimulus is a fickle, fickle <laughs> beast. Uh, the reality is, 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 and not to provide too much political commentary, but the reality is, is, is that I, mean, I think the forecasts are that we're going to have a divided house and, and Senate, no matter what happens, and, and, and regardless of who the president is that comes in, we're going to have a, a stalemate situation not dissimilar to what we've had in the last two years. Now, that hopefully will change. And um, in our business, we don't particularly care which way. Um, we just like to see some action coming out of government. But, but for a you know a company that's making decisions on a three, six month time cycle, um, even with uh, the ability to see stimulus money come through the fastest you'll see it. And I think the R grant process was actually fairly fast um, considering the circumstances and, and what was funded out of it. Um, you know, the chances of that making it down to a venture-backed company, particularly in this early stages, is, is just not something you plan out. 
Yeah, I'll make that commentary that nothing I'm about to say reflects at all on the Siemens Corporation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, frankly, again, it could go it could go either direction. Both both would potentially help us. I'll tell you, out of the last stimulus program, now we were venture funded at the time that the last one um, came through, and what it introduced for us was a tremendous number of pilots. Pilots are not highly revenue generating, no matter what they are. Um, so, um, unless it mandates, you know, full rollout um, and compliance, then it's not going to be there. Whereas, at the same time, could they change regulations that would demand that? They could, but they won't. Um, so, um, you could argue that less and more competition may be the better way to go. So, I think either way is going to be very interesting for us. But uh, the stimulus program uh, does not put rose-colored glasses on us. We actually had some good fortune, actually, the stimulus funding, uh, if you look at this market last time, that they went to the utilities. It didn't actually go to the, uh, the technology guys. And so what it did for us was enable a couple of our customers who were on the fence with the economic case, and they got a 50-50 cost check, so the government put in 100 million, and they got 100 million. It enabled some of the projects which were maybe marginal or they couldn't afford in their budgets went across the line. So we did in fact benefit by a couple of relatively large customers who did actually do a project that may have not, so we did actually benefit from that. Uh, if I was to have a wish for the next time, it would be more for my friend Dave running my engineering and we were actually successful in Quebec in winning some stimulus money that went directly into research and development for new technologies. So if, if I were to see something on that side would be investment this time maybe in directly into the vendors and the technology developers to get some more help in regards to developing new no, new technologies and not so much in doing new projects or pilots. Why don't we have three more questions and then we'll call it. Uh, at the Innovation Center at Sutter Health, we're working on the medical home. And the question I have is, where, what can we use today that will give us more timely uh, utility information uh, in the home or in uh, uh, you know, a nursing home? So, well, I'll start. <laughs> um, I mean, today, first and foremost, I would say, you know, the information uh, is is available out there to see. Yes, it's on a 24-hour delay. Um, you can go in and just see how people are using energy. I, I can't tell you how many customers I've been with when I show them the chart of actually how you use energy during the day. It does bring kind of that first order awareness that really is a significant uh, a significant move forward. Um, that it also enables us to communicate with customers in a very different way. It allows us to send text messages when you're crossing over different tiers throughout the month in your, in your energy bills. Um, it enables us to engage you know, on an ongoing basis throughout. I think the last thing I mentioned is really the home area networking, which um, you know, frankly right now, from what I've seen so far, I think the biggest prim promise for home area networking is just bringing real-time data and showing it to customers. We still need more standards development, I think, to enable really the whole ecosystem to start to build to connect. Uh, I think it's there. Um, but you know, we are already seeing tremendous opportunities with you know, smarter thermostats. You mentioned Nest and others. There's uh, many ventures out there that we have that help provide that level of information and control uh, to customers today. It's not as fast as we'd like it to be, but it's definitely coming, and I think there's a great opportunity. I will also say that there's an entire ecosystem of third-party energy monitoring applications, devices, uh, that you can also go and, and purchase and play with that give you a uh, fairly high fidelity level access to your energy use on a real-time basis. It's not ideal, but it, it uh, is certainly out there and it's something you can look into. And the other thing for critical health care for patients or for people who are in a situation that need electricity or power, and the utilities have the capability to be able to detect. So when your particular center is out on an outage and they know it's critical through whatever systems you've got and you don't have backup generation or what have you, that you become automatically the priority customer to get there and have an instantaneous recognition so the crews will go as top priority there as, as first responders. Thank you. 
I was at a talk a couple months ago where the speaker mentioned that there's been some analysis work, I think, uh, in Europe actually, saying that uh, renewables like sun and wind could actually make up as much as 80% of the generation capacity and be accommodated with modest investment and accommodation. Um, so I'd like you to comment on that. And related to that, you had mentioned earlier that 20% of our power is used to push water around. I wonder if that load could be modulated to help with the, the generation and, and load demand curves that uh, you know you get from renewables. And then lastly, um, when I go to the internet websites, I get this pop-up on this, save 75% of your energy bill around the looking device. Is that real or is that a scam? Let me try and address the grid level questions first. Uh, there's been a lot of different studies about what is the level of adoption we can bring onto the grid for wind and solar. Many different answers. I think it does depend a lot on your assumptions. Um, if you're willing to look at the United States as an entire system that's fully integrated and assume, like I said earlier, that I can take Wyoming wind power and move it to load centers, you can obviously get a lot more um, wind and solar on. If you look at them um, in smaller centers and say how much could PG&E put on on its system by itself, it's a more complicated answer. The, um, the, the thing I think that is critical is really how much, how are we going to provide the integration resource? So what is going to be the integration resource? The thing that's gonna turn on in that nine minute period to respond to the 120 megawatts of wind as the wind starts to die down in one plant. You've gotta have that flexibility and control. If you can bring the demand side into that equation and allow demand resources to compete, if, and there you go. <laughs> if you can um, maintain uh, the right portfolio of assets such that you, know, you make sure you've got solar on when wind is off and wind on when solar is off, you, know, you can see much higher penetrations. But it is a little bit of a different answer in different places. California is already moving towards 33% renewables. We will be there in 2020. Um, I think we're leading the country in that. We're gonna have, and when you include the hydro assets that uh, don't count towards renewables, we're gonna be inching towards 40 and 50%. Um, I think that's something to be really proud of. I also think we need to make sure we move in measured pace so that we don't embed a lot more cost into the system um, and inappropriately. Hi, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, the gentleman from STEM, so you mentioned batteries as a technology for doing the kind of hybridization. Are there other technologies that could reach into that space, and are you using any of them? And uh, you know, what, what's the kind of what, the, what are the possibilities for those energy storage? That's actually a great question, and, and a ton of technology for you know, as a company, we've. Uh, made a really big point of being agnostic in, in what type of technologies we use. And we've looked at everything from ultra capacitors uh, to GE's got a literally a molten salt that's at 300 degrees Celsius battery uh, to mini compressed air. And you know, what we have found for our applications is that it looks a lot like an electric vehicle. And therefore, electric vehicle batteries make a lot of sense in that context. Uh, but it's something that we continually look at. Um, there's been a lot of promise in a lot of different technologies. Um, the thing we always ask for is, can we get a sample? And can you make a lot of them? And so far, the answer to both those you know, questions has been pitifully small in terms of the number of providers that are out there. Uh, but we have faith. We've talked to some really amazing companies. Um, and we have believed in the next three to four years that we will see the fruits of the billions of dollars that have been invested so far in EV battery technologies. And then I just wanted to ask you if the smart meters that are currently installed give you the kind of resolution you want or you actually have to improve the resolution. We share the same issue as every person in this room does, which is, boy, we'd like to have access to that other port. <laughs> Do the smart meters sample that a second? Uh, smart meters are on a mechanical basis. Uh, do sample on actually on a sub-second level basis. They do have an issue in that they use ring buffers for the most part and that they can't store more than a minute's worth of data. And so the utilities will typically, with the current polling mechanisms, not be able to give you that level of data through their smart meter infrastructure. Um, but if you have it access to locally, you can't get uh, that type of data. Can I 
I ask a very important question of the audience? What's the score in the Giants game? Thank you. All right. Let's give a big hand to the panelists and the moderators. Just a couple.